I'm here today to talk a, a little bit about what I've been engaged with the last few years, about trying to get computer science as a, an essential discipline in the national curriculum, how code touches everything we do in the world today, how we have to empower our creatives with these new skills for them to drive the digital economy going forward. And I'm, to put that into context, I'm going to talk a bit about my own industry, the games industry, and how that's transitioned from a physical product to a digital service, how the business models are changing from, from a premium pricing to a freemium pricing with in-app purchases, and, and all the skills necessary to make games, and how the challenges of the digital world are so much more than those of the analog world, unless, of course, you have the right skills. So, Starting off, so as I said, my world was, was like everybody else's not too long ago. It's old world manufacturing. It's turning me on. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello, and welcome to... Uh... You should be so <laughs> What am I supposed to say? Okay, oh, I can hear myself now. That's even terrible. So, like many things, I come from the old world manufacturing. Um, I made traditional games, um, board games and... And the, and the like, and uh, this, uh, this is me back in 1975, this really handsome guy here. Uh, so when we started a company called uh, Games Workshop, there were three of us, and uh, we had a, a vision of, of, of making games, which was our hobby, into a business. And um, we sent out a newsletter to everybody we knew in games, and one of the recipients was this gentleman here, sadly no longer with us. This is Gary Gygax, who'd invented Dungeon Dragon. So this is a little... Who's heard of Dungeons and Dragons in this room? Okay, this is good, this is good. So I don't have to explain the rationale behind the fact that it's a role-playing game, it's, it's uh, interactive theatre, uh, created on the fly between the games master and the players who take on roles of being heroes and wizards and, and clerics, etc., and go on these fantastic journeys in their mind about um, killing monsters and finding treasure. So um, we... Gary Gygax wrote to us and said, uh, love your magazine, here's this game I just invented. Uh, Steve, there were three of us, and Steve and I loved it. Uh, the third member of, of Workshop hated it and left at that point. And um, we ordered six copies of Dungeons & Dragons on the back of that. We got an exclusive distribution agreement for Europe for three years. Such was the uh, state of the industry back then in its um, embryonic state. So. We went over to the States, um, yeah, and holding the boxes there. We met Gary Gygax and, and co. We even got to see Miss Wisconsin at the time. <laughs> where is she now? I don't know where, where she is. If any of you have seen her recently, let me know. That was 1976. And uh, we, we, we came back to this back and had our little office. Um, we got kicked out of our, our apartment because the landlord got fed up with all these um, mail orders and, and people milling around looking for this shop. Of course, it wasn't a shop, it was just a flat. So we had to live in a van for nearly four months because we had to make a choice where to have a, somewhere to live or somewhere to operate. So this is our tiny little office. And uh, eventually we decided to open our own shops because um, we were having a lot of trouble getting other retailers to understand what a role-playing game was. And therefore, we had to um, do it ourselves. So this is the, the very first shop. This is Games Workshop in April 1978. Of course, Games Workshop has since grown up and has a much more corporate look. And, and this shop in Hammersmith is, is no longer open. I drove past it quite recently. It's now the Bosnia and Herzegovina <laughs> Community <laughs> Advice Center. So there we are. So Workshop is also famous for, 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 for creating Warhammer. And one thing that's important as I recall back then, is, is if you create your own intellectual property, that builds so much more value in, in, in your own business than just being effectively a, a distributor. So if you think what we were doing, we were effectively being parcel forwarders of Dungeons & Dragons. We didn't own the IP. And at the end of that three-year exclusive distribution agreement, when Guy Gax said, let's merge these two companies, his own company, TSR, and Games Workshop, we... Steve and I were you know, sort of traditional British, no one's going to tell me what to do, uh, we, won't, uh, we won't merge with you. And so we had to find a product that replaced Dungeons & Dragons. And um, what I say to a lot of young people today is that if you want to build real value, don't just work for hire as long as you have to to get started, but then 
create your own content, retain ownership of that content. I'm not talking about piracy, but I'm talking about legal ownership of it. So they can leverage that through merchandising and licensing and build value and scale that to big audiences around the world. So it's all about IP creation. And so Games Workshop, miniature figures, still in this physical world, it was easy to keep a, a track of what you were creating, uh, a visible track. It was a, a much easier process in, in the analog world. And as Stephen said, I also, with Steve, um, created um, a series of interactive game books, um, books where the reader is the hero, is taking the essence of role playing it and, and turning that games master in, into, a, into, a <coughs> into a book where you have to make choices, turn left, turn right, fight the monster, run away from the monster, etc. But again, this is all in the physical world. Um, I got into, into video games in, by design in, in 1984 when I created the uh, design, the, a, a game called Eureka for a, a new British developer called uh, Domark. And Domark metamorphosed in 95 into IDOS. And I joined the company um, in 92 and then held floats IDOS in 95 on the, on the London Stock Exchange. And we launched Tomb Raider. Um, Tomb Raiders now have over 30 million sales. It's been a huge success story. It went from a, from a game to a franchise to a brand uh, and all the extensions of it, whether it's movies or, or records or whatever. So again, it's that owning intellectual property that's so important. But the difference here is that the skills necessary to make a video game or a computer game are so markedly different from those required to make physical products. And so we're now in the age of digital games. Um, there's hundreds of millions of players now playing games. Everyone's carrying a, a games device around in their, their pockets in the shapes of a, of a smartphone or a tablet. And there's been 800 million downloads of Angry Birds. Who's got Angry Birds? You're not alone. Um, there's 65 million registered users of Moshi Monsters, a great British success story from Mind Candy. There's millions of people playing games on Facebook. Uh, social games have, have grown in incredibly to a point where some 400 million people are playing games on, on Facebook. And there are still, of course, the console blockbusters, the traditional console games, which are the sort of the high end, the, the sort of Hollywood <coughs> graphic intense, interactive cinematic experiences that you would get on, on a, a console like uh, Xbox 360 or, or PlayStation 3. And if you look what some of the, the revenues were associated with, with hit franchises on consoles, you know, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 3 sold 6.5 million copies in 24 hours in the UK and the USA alone. And since it's had over a billion dollars in revenue. So if you're able to do it well, you can, there's huge economic returns from, from making video games. And just to put that into context, the global market for software sales alone, not including hardware, is $50 billion a year. And that's estimated to rise to $90 billion by 2015. So games have moved from a, a niche to a, a mainstream audience. You know, children play games. Old people like me still play games. Everybody's playing games. And it really has become part of, of mainstream culture as games really help to define us of who we are as human beings now. Because we are naturally playful. It's just that we're often too embarrassed to admit that we enjoy playing games. So as games have become more mainstream, um, so the, it has been more uh, established as a, as a genuine art form. In fact, BAFTA now celebrates an award ceremony, so it gives it, elevates the status of games as, a, as a, an important, if not more important in some cases, as, as music, television, and, and of course film and theatre. So what's happening in the UK in the games industry? Well, we are, I would say, perhaps one of the most creative nations in the world. Look at the, our fashion, our film, our theatre, our music, our television, our advertising, our architecture, and of course, our games. And some of the biggest blockbusters around the world have been created in the UK. And there are some fantastic new studios emerging in, in the digital space. <laughs> able to serve content directly to consumers via super high-speed broadband and able to scale their business and as, uh, as their games move from a product to a service. Um, let me just show you a quick movie of some of the games that are being developed in the UK today still. <laughs> Thank you. 
So the, as I said, the video games industry is worth $50 billion a year, and yet the UK slipped from third to sixth in global rankings of, of development. And there was a, that was, from my mind, a tragi tragedy given the heritage we had at, at creating games from the very early start of the industry. We recognize there was a shortage of skills necessary to make games, a shortage of computer programmers, a shortage of artists, and a shortage of animators. And like so many games, like so many industries in the digital world, it's a combination of art and technology that's it's essential for making video games. It's that combination of bringing together the arts and sciences, which for children, often, so often in schools, they have to make a choice between do you want to study the arts, do you want to study sciences? So our perfect graduate, for example, is someone with a double first in maths, physics, and art. So the shortage of computer programmers was a problem. And um, I whinged a lot to Ed Vasey, the culture minister, and told him about the problem we had as an industry. And he, I'm delighted to say, um, requested that we write a review from myself and Alex Hope, who's the MD of Double Negative, uh, one of the large, perhaps the, the largest visual effects co company in the, in the UK. And we were tasked with um, doing a whole review of the whole talent pipeline in the UK from, from universities down to schools and also CPD. And so we were given um, the resource of Nesta, who funded and also helped do all the drafting of the, of the documentation necessary for, for next gen. And if you want to download it, you can see our report from nesta.org.uk. And the point is, it's not just about how we consume technology. And our report is not just about the video games industry. It's applicable to all the creative digital industries, whether it's music, film, TV, or whether it's design and net jet, jet propulsion engine, or fighting cybercrime, or financial services. Computer programming, computer code, is, is central to everything we do in the world today. And so it's about empowering the digital creativity. In my analog world, I was able to control my own destiny. Now I don't have the skills to make the games that I want to, so I have to I'm, I'm totally dependent on computer programmers. And that's frustrating for, my, for myself, but for new creatives who don't have that training, it's an absolute sin and has to change from now. So we're at sort of a tipping point in civilization. And as Douglas Rushkoff says in his book, do we direct technology or do we let ourselves be directed by technology? So we looked at the whole talent pipeline. We started at higher education. Um, there are 144 universities in the UK offering games as a, as a course, as a subject matter. And yet, wearing my creative skill set hat, so I chair also the Video Games Council for the Creative Skill Set. Out of those 144 courses, only 10 have been accredited as fit for purpose. Most of these courses, unfortunately, were more concerned with the philosophy of games, uh, giving teaching soft skills about the social relevance of, of games, some design, but they weren't giving students the hard skills necessary to make them. They were failing to deliver computer science, art, and animation as required for our industry and others. And there have been, over the last few years, a 10% year per year drop-off in students applying to do computer science at university, including Cambridge. And as Albert Einstein said, the only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. So we found that it wasn't actually the fault of the teachers or of the universities. The fault really lay in, in schools. And ICT, as currently taught, is useful in that children learn about how to use applications, they learn how to use Word, PowerPoint and Excel, but they're given no insight whatsoever how technology is created. Against all odds, we've managed to turn them off technology for life by boring them to death, by making them simple slaves for user interface and give them no inspiration or insight how to create their own technology. So for the last 20 years we've done them a huge disservice. And it seems crazy with such high youth and employment that we're not giving these creative children the skills to make content for the digital economy. Um, the video. 
So excuse me one second as I exit this and load up my video, which was a video we made to accompany uh, our Next Gen Skills report. It's a bit long. I might just cut it out before we finish, but um, I think you find it very useful. See, I told you I didn't have the skills. Right, make it play. I think all the special effects are made in America. I think all the big video games we've made in China, Japan. Special effects and things are usually, don't usually do them out with this country, places like New Zealand. Video games are probably made in Silicon Valley around San Francisco. America. China, Japan. America and Japan. America. New Zealand, Japan. San Francisco. <laughs> now I think we've come an age where we can actually be proud of what we're doing because we are creating great content which is culturally, socially and economically important to this country. In a digital age, schools and universities are failing the creative industries. There are a few shining examples of best practice. What we want to try and do with this report is make those shining examples the norm. One such example of best practice is a primary school in Girvan on the west coast of Scotland, where pupils are learning a whole host of creative and technical skills whilst making their very own video games. I made the biker follow a path, but Kodu has to stay off that path so he doesn't bump into the biker. I've made a game with a factory with bikers coming out, and then I'm a, I'm a jet and I'm trying to reach that star. This games design project wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for forward-thinking teachers like Avril Denton. I think Kodu is more motivational when teaching a lot of these skills, problem-solving skills, math skills, language skills, it motivates them. Problem-solving, puzzle-solving, choice and consequence, intuitive learning, management, simulations, social aspects and even dexterity. They are a great thing. They're coming here and they're learning how to create games and they can then go home and create games or play their own games. You feel really special that that's your game being played by different people. I would like to make games for people to buy them all over the world. It's opened their eyes really because the children have realised that you know this is a job that they could do and they're, they're starting at a very early level but they could see right I could, I could go on and do this for a living. This is Sackboy. He's a familiar icon of the digital age to millions. He's the star of Little Big Planet, a game which enables anyone to create a world of their own. He sums up the creative power of video games, even for the youngest players. Little Big Planet has been recognised with countless industry awards, including several BAFTAs. Technical director Alex Evans and creative director Mark Healy put their success down to an eclectic mix of artists and programmers working side by side. Traditionally, you divide it into code, art and design. We decided that the more people we could hire who could do two things in those kind of categories, the better. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can program, but you're an artist. Yeah. Um, I can't draw, but I wish I could. And so there isn't really a sense of awareness that you're in different jobs. You, you have slightly different strengths. Alex's path into the games industry was something he pursued off his own back. He believes that if he'd had the opportunity to make the most of his passion in computing at school, 
it could have transformed his entire educational experience. Partitions between subjects are quite strong. And um, I wish someone had said, yeah, you're allowed to use your computer to write music for your music GCSE. To me as a child, that would have been awesome because for me, programming and learning graphics and uh, all the stuff I ended up using in my in industry was stuff I did at home away from school. Secondary schools don't seem very aware of this kind of thing at all. I mean, I think they're very like, you're going to do English, you're going to do history, like quite kind of traditional. It would have been helpful if I'd known that I could have taken my hobby to a different level at that point. I think they need to understand that you can do art and technical and be successful at the same time. What we would love to see is more people understanding that that means that from the very earliest stage of education, art and sciences go together. Group learning goes with that because that's part of how we work in industry. What we're trying to achieve with this report is to create a culture where that is understood, encouraged and incentivized right the way across the education system. An educational establishment steeped in tradition, Merchant Taylor's Independent School for Boys is famous for its high academic standards in subjects like classics and history. But the school recognises the importance of teaching programming to meet the needs of careers of the 21st century. We have many children for whom computing is a passion, it's a hobby, it's as relevant to today's children as stamp collecting or chess was to a previous generation. If you look at the applications that have conquered the world in the last decade, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they've come from the combination of computer programming skills with creativity. It's by turning out children with that sort of versatility rooted in traditional academic values, but who are applying those values in a new, technologically-based society. But as Kim Blake from Blitz Game Studio stresses, the computer programming that industry wants to see taught in schools is very different from traditional teaching of ICT. These are people who are on Facebook at the age of 10. They don't need to spend a year learning how to use Excel. What they need are people who will teach them how to program, how to draw, how to use this technology really, really well, and that will give us the sort of creative brilliance that the UK is capable of. Learning about Word, Excel and PowerPoint is not going to get you a career in the high-tech creative industries. The sooner that parents, teachers, pupils realise that, the better chance this country has to build on the firm foundations that we've established. What we want is for people to learn about computer programming. It's something that children absolutely enjoy, computer programming. It's a creative computing. They can build games, they can learn from playing games, they can make games together. It's a shared experience and something they can feel very proud of and it prepares them for real life. I love programming a lot. As in, I've started off with Scratch. What we learn at school gives us a general idea of what we, need to, what we will need to know for the future. The digital world is changing in front of our eyes. And with it, new careers are opening up, requiring new combinations of skills. It's that combination of art, which allows you to go beyond what is there, and maths, which helps you understand what is there, that is absolutely crucial. In our work, we're simulating how buildings collapse, which is physics. We're understanding how rivers flow, computational fluid dynamics. They all work together. We wrap science and art together at every turn, every minute of our working day. For our work on 2012, we were dealing with simulations uh, pyroclastic ash clouds sort of flooding into the scene, uh, lava bombs crashing down, having huge impacts on the environment. But the technical skills behind those require, you know, strong sort of maths, they re require strong computer skills, and to make it all look good, once you've accomplished the technical tasks, um, you generally need to have a good eye. My dream graduate would be somebody with maths, physics and art. Sadly, there are very few of them.
One university stands out, and its approach is completely in line with what the industry is crying out for. Catherine Roberts has worked on Hollywood blockbusters like Iron Man 2. She puts her success in the industry down to the animation course she took at Bournemouth University. One of the strengths of the Bournemouth courses are how in tune they are with the industry itself. And it was an invaluable way for me to get into the visual effects industry. The National Centre for Computer Animation at Bournemouth University was founded by Peter Komenos on the ethos that there should be a marriage of art and science in equal amounts. This is very similar to what happens in architecture, for instance. Uh, you need to create a building which is aesthetically pleasing and people would like to live in, and also a building that's structurally sound and it won't fall on their heads and kill them. With the skills we give them, they're able to survive and thrive in both industries. Unfortunately, it seems Bournemouth is one of the very few higher education institutions that fully prepares its graduates for jobs in the industry. Over the last few years, we've seen a plethora of courses that purport to serve our industry. There are a few examples of best practice, but there are far too many that are enticing students in with a prospectus that doesn't reflect the needs of industry. Dare to be digital at Abertay University in Dundee and Gamer Camp at Birmingham City University are higher education initiatives aimed at addressing the needs of the industry. Teams of artists and programmers are mentored by industry figures whilst they create their very own game, helping them to secure a job. They can now come to us and they can say, this is a game that we made. And we can look at it, we can judge the quality, we can look at the code, we can look at the art and say, these people are good, good enough or not good enough for this job. Some of the participants at Birmingham's Gamer Camp already have a university degree, but have come here to top up their skills to give them a better chance of getting a job. The course that I did at university isn't on the list of any of the uh, universities that is accredited by Skillset. If I had gone for the job that I would go for now, having not done this course, I would have been refused straight away on my portfolio because it would, it, they're very specific in what they want for their portfolios. Three of the UK's accredited courses are in Dundee's Abertay University, where two years ago, Sean Donnelly took part in the acclaimed Dare to be Digital competition. As a result, he landed a top job at Criterion Games. Doing Dare to be Digital was key in me getting a job in the industry. Uh, without it, it would have been much tougher. Abertay is a great example of where they haven't operated as an independent silo apart from industry. They've engaged with industry and together that shared knowledge, that shared learning, shared experience has created a fantastic ecosystem where industry helps academia, academia helps industry and they have proven that they are an absolute genuine centre of excellence. The team-based environment that DARE offered really helped Sean secure his job in games. Uh, Derby Digital, there was five of us on the team, two artists and three coders, so we were able to interact very well, we were successful, our game did quite well in there, and so yeah, again, I could show off these skills on my CV, I had that demo, so yeah, it was all key. We are a creative nation, and we're very good at understanding and using technology. We are a world leader in content creation. It's absolutely essential that our students are given the right skills to carry that heritage through. So, so our first rec number one recommendation out of a series of 20 recommendations was Supreme Computer Science the School's National Curriculum is an essential discipline. This is nothing new. In 1980s, we were already doing that. The BBC Micro was a cornerstone of computing in schools. In the home, the Sinclair Spectrum was an affordable, programmable computer in which people were able to create content. And creating that content back then gave rise to 
the games industry and other digital industries at that time. But all that got forgotten and locked down. As computers were no longer able to be accessed by, by people to be able to program them. So in summary of our, of our recommendations, ICT is a computer science, what reading is to writing. We teach our children to read, we don't teach them how to write. We teach them how to use an application, we don't teach them how to make an application. And of course, we're all part of the STEAM agenda, not just the STEM agenda, to put the art into STEM. And we say a, a digital economy can't be built by a nation of digital literates. And we're trying to put forward the, the idea that computer science should be the fourth science, of equal sta status to the other sciences, as an option for anybody who has that passion to create technology to be able to do so. Now, not everybody's going to become a computer scientist, but then everyone's going to become a physicist or a chemist or a biologist but they must have that opportunity to study it. And such is the, the world in which we live, in which computers touch everything we do. We say that computer science is effectively the new Latin as it underpins everything in the world that we live. So what happened when we released our report back in, in February last year, um, it, it, it was published and supported by the industry in particular, but we realized that just publishing was not enough. So we set up a cross-sector coalition uh, funded by Yuki, the uh, Games Trade Association. And we got other people to sign up. And some of our partners included Google, Microsoft, Facebook. Uh, these are obviously quite heavy hitters, but they all recognized the system. The same, they had the same problems that we were having as an industry. They just simply couldn't get enough computer scientists. And so we, we lobbied quite strongly. Uh, about the introduction of an industry-relevant computer science course with a curriculum, and also the promotion <coughs> of, of physics and art and computer science, etc. But would Dexter become another dusty old tome? Well, it might have done if it hadn't been for Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, who a year ago, almost today, in his uh, famous Matt Taggart lecture in, in Edinburgh, said that he was flabbergasted to learn that computer science isn't taught as standard in the UK schools, and his IT curriculum focuses on teaching how to use software but gives no insight into how it's made. And he referenced NextGen in his, in his uh, Q&A. And of course, if Eric said it, it must be true. Because the Prime Minister, a month later in Tech City, said, I think Eric Schmidt is right. We're not doing enough to teach the next generation of programmers. And suddenly the door was open. And we were invited to number 10 and to meet Michael Gove's special advisors. And the penny dropped. And to his credit, at his best speech in January this year, he made the famous announcement that the current program of study for ICT is going to be withdrawn this September, i.e. this month we're in today, and with replaced with an ICT curriculum that has computer science at its core. And this course could be transformational to be able to empower our creatives with these new digital skills. And of course, the Royal Society backed our claims by saying every child should have the opportunity to learn computing at school, including exposure to computer science as a rigorous academic discipline. So now the door is open to take our work for further as we move from recommendation to implementation. And we want a lot of flexibility in this, from whether it's going to be informal learning as well as formal learning. And we also want to promote computer science for the English baccalaureate. With the net result, by the age of 11, we want children to be able to create 2D animations using languages like Scratch, and by 16, to be able to program their own application, and by 18, even perhaps write their own simple programming language. And we're working with our many partners, but indeed one of our best partners has been the British Computer Society and their affiliate organization, Computing at School, who've got about 1,100 members who are able to teach computer science today. Of course, there are 25,000 schools in the UK, and this is not going to happen overnight, but we have to start somewhere. We can't afford to ignore it any longer. So they've got 500 schools already in their network, and those schools are also going to act as centers of excellence so they can teach schools around them. And the teachers shouldn't be afraid. I mean, it's not the teacher's fault. They've been lumbered with a curriculum that is not right for the century in which we live. So there's a teaching pack available. If anybody interested, you can always download it from, from this website, from the British Computer Society organization. And now, of course, we're asking the DFE to do their, play their part by training the next generation of teachers to be able to teach computer science and also offer 
uh, training for existing ICT teachers. And obviously this is death by PowerPoint in this slide, but the, the, the essence of this is that in places like, in countries like Israel and Finland, this has already been happening for, for a number of years. In Israel, for example, they've had computer science on, the, on their curriculum for the last 12 years. And guess what? It's no coincidence that some of the best high-tech intellectual property is coming out of Israel. And they have a, a central resource called Makshava, which is a, a focal point for any teachers who wants to find out more about teaching computer science. So how are we going to teach this, this new language? Well, when we come into this world, we, we learn through play. We are natural learners. No one else has to stand up and beat us to death trying to make us understand things. People naturally play, and we interact and we learn in a natural way. And so I think we have to trust on the outset that you can't teach children young enough to teach, to learn, to understand computer science. They have a natural curiosity, the way they learn a language. Computer science is a language, they can learn it in an almost similar way. And if teachers are frightened of, of, IC, of, of computer science, they shouldn't be. They can act as facilitators, enablers. You could flip the classroom around where the children go online using YouTube or any resource, go to MIT, learn from the best people in the world at night instead of doing their homework, do their learning at night. And when they come into the classroom, let the teachers be facilitators as they do this collaboratively. And that shared learning is going to help them grow and work as a team. I've seen it happen. You cannot hear a pin drop sometimes when these children are so absorbed by doing this collaborative work of artists and scientists working together, creating code, creating something that expresses themselves on, on a monitor. And you've got them for life then, rather than just boring to death by doing simple using other people's technology, allow them to create their own. But it has to be fun and relevant to their lives. As was said in the film, they come into this world as digital natives. They know all this stuff almost intuitively from, from being toddlers. You've seen you know, babies and as young as two working and operating an iPad. They can learn this very simply. So it has to be fun, give them freedom, relevance and exciting. Of course we need formal learning and that's why we're involved so much with, with schools and with the DFE. It has to be a rigorous curriculum at the end of the day and learning about algorithms and coding and computational thinking and of course an exam at the end of it. But informal learning is for my mind, to my mind also as much as important. How, teach, how children are so good at, at learning offline as well as, as online in their, in their world. So if you go somewhere like the Khan, of Canabit, Khan Academy, you can learn computer science directly from that website. There has to be a cultural understanding of the digital world, as Eleanor Mulqueeny says from Young Wid Riot States, children will not learn how to live, work and cope in this digitally driven world without having a deep cultural understanding of how it works. And they will not have this deep cultural understanding by sitting in closed classrooms, measured by set targets, removed from the digital society and banned from the open web. Another initiative that could help in this process is the Raspberry Pi. Anybody in the room got a Raspberry Pi? I knew you would. <laughs> um, rather like the BBC Micro all those years ago in 1980, the Raspberry Pi is an amazing invention. It's a programmable computer. It's about the size of a credit card. It's got HDMI, USB, audio, SD card ports. It runs a Linux operating system and it will run video to the standard of, of, a, of an iPhone. Yet it only costs 22 pounds. For 15 million pounds, you could give one to every child in the country. I remember Michael Gove recently saying that he wants to put, give every child a Bible. Give them the, the Raspberry Pi and have the Bible as software embedded on the Raspberry Pi. And what else you can do with that? Fantastic. So the Next Gen Skills Coalition moves on. We're having great success. If you want to know more about it, you can always email Theo. Always welcome new members to sign up to the Next Gen Skills Campaign. And if you want to download it, you can from www.nesta.org.uk. I've got three hard copies if anyone prefers the analog version. Um, but we've had over 20,000 downloads so, so far. 
Um, just to finish off, a person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. Obviously, we're going to make mistakes as we go along, but we can't afford to get things all, everything lined up and compartmentalized. It has to be done now with the best will in the world, as we'll fall further behind. So, uh, thank you very much. If anyone has any questions in my befuddled state, um, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Ten minutes. You've got ten minutes, and uh, and I've got the microphone. So uh, and somebody just said on Twitter, "Wow!" So that went pretty well in, I think. From how I hope you can see that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. A few questions. Um, one, uh, fifteen million pounds, you say, can get every child in this country a Raspberry Pi. I tried to buy one for my two boys, both teenagers, and uh, what I found is that most of them are being bought by adults. So the big question is. Who are the philanthropists that are going to pay for the, the construction of more Raspberry Pis for young people? And second is, in terms of tabletop gaming, uh, Germany leads tabletop gaming now, and Settlers of Catan has sold 25 million copies worldwide, and they're selling more, uh, more uh, boxes of this game every year since they, they put it in uh, than, uh, than any other game in existence. So what do you think is the, the role of the tabletop game now? Okay, in reverse order. Uh, tabletop games, you're talking to a fan here. I've got over a thousand board games at home, but we won't talk about that. And Settlers of Catan is one of my, you know, is, is up there as a, being a fantastic game. The thing about a tabletop game is that it's social. And so many games in the, in the video space, in the console era, the high points of this console era, was a single player experience. Now, anything we do in life is enhanced if we do it together. Apart from the obvious, is also having food, uh, going for meals, looking at a sunset, everything we do, any shared experience is always enhanced if we do it with other people. And the beauty about a board game is not only you're enjoying it together, there's that wonderful satisfaction when you stab your friend in the back having done a dirty deed on them in, in the middle of a game. So that is a, a wonderful experience, and uh, board games can also be now in, played via the internet, of course. Uh, Settlers of Catan, Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride. There are a number of classic board games available to be played on, the, on, on, on tablet devices. So long may board games continue, um, and I'm not surprised at their sales. And yes, the Germans are fantastic at making board games, and it's such a shame that so many other countries have given up on making board games. And, uh, that's clearly the Germans are the best at making board games, no question about it. To your Raspberry Pi question, of course, the Raspberry Pi Foundation is a charity, but I'm hoping that the government, for a fraction of the budget they spend on education, would seem it'd be money well spent to fund the purchase of a Raspberry Pi for every child in the country. Of course, it's a bit like sowing seeds, a lot of those will be fallow but there'll be enough there to make it worthwhile, I think, for those who actually become excited and empowered by having to create technology. And, and, they, were, and they were overwhelmed by the sheer number of orders. I mean, the backlog yes. was vast, which is hugely encouraging. I think there's 800,000 on back order now. So they're now outsourcing the manufacture to a separate company. Philanthropy has no role in the vision. It has to be a government-run thing. No, it is a charity. The Raspberry Pi no, is no, a charity. No, that, that is, absolutely. But in terms of having Microsoft and Google and IDOS leading a next-gen skills campaign to put this into schools, what is the philanthropic role, in your opinion? Where, where do these companies actually place themselves in the next skills that will come into schools? Are they, are they going in as contractors? Are they going in as philanthropists who are trying to build the seeds of tomorrow? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you're trying to say. All I'm saying, I'm not wearing my IDOS hat with next-gen skills. This is just a thing that has to be done. Now, our next-gen skills partners are helping, not helping funding. Uh, it's all been done by Yuki, the trade association so far. We are a completely under-resourced network of people trying to make this happen. We're hoping by waving the flag loud, no, waving it, not you don't wave a flag loud, but by waving the flag <laughs> <laughs> hard enough that people will, will hopefully join our cause and maybe philanthropy will, will add to our coffers. Well, I we, hope so. Before we get dragged into a whole debate about where the business model is in all this, maybe more of that tomorrow. Let's have some more questions, yeah. 
Um, hi, I um, really like your video, I really like your work. Um, but the, the video opened with a quote that 3% um, of children didn't know where GTA had been made. Yeah. GTA is an adult game with an 18 certificate. <laughs> does, does that surprise you? No, but all children have probably heard of Grand Theft Auto, whether they've been allowed to play it or not. The point we're trying to make is that the co people in this country are unaware of the career opportunities, which is, which is ridiculous. You know, if, with the high youth employing the points I was making earlier, this is a very viable career opportunity. And it was only 12% of parents, and they're all adults, so there's one in eight. Yeah. Let's see over there. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the uh, perspective of teachers in schools. Do you think that they have the skills to teach this new type of curriculum? And um, if they don't, and we need to train more teachers who do, um, will those teachers with um, advanced computer programming skills be willing to work in the classroom, or will they be tempted by you know, private sector employment elsewhere? I mean, how are we going to fill these? Um, classrooms with highly skilled teachers? <coughs> well, one, we're asking of DfE to start immediately a teacher training um, courses for, for new people coming in because people had actually moved away from wanting to teach ICT because the subject itself was so boring. But now, if it's a credible subject with <laughs> computer science at its core, hopefully more people will be attracted into teaching or wanted to learn how to teach computer science. For those ICT teachers who are unable to do it today, we're hoping that the network of, of CAS teachers will act as a, as, as a center of excellence and help them learn. And the last point I made about group learning, if they're, ha if they're willing and not worried about the ego problems of, of having to be a teacher which elevates themselves above the, their children, they're willing to work with the children as facilitators, as enablers, <coughs> and have this group learning where they're all effectively learning together, that's an absolute possibility to get this thing going. We can't afford not to do it. So people out of industry, we're hoping, are going to come in, not necessarily working today in highly paid jobs, who perhaps retired or doing something else, but know how to. Everybody has to kind of muck in the way everyone has done that, I think, in the Olympic Games. I think the Olympic Games is kind of typifies what could happen with computer science, with volunteers and initiative and vision and desire to want to do this. We, got, we shouldn't be worried about formal structures. We just have to get on with it. And uh, one last question, maybe. You might just sneak back at this quick. Maybe two. This has this been touched on earlier today. A lot of us are running new media courses, web media courses, social media courses, gaming courses, etc. We need to make sure that the students apply for those courses. And to do that, it needs a national campaign which shows the jobs that they can go into. Because often their parents, as the part of their network, and they and their careers teachers don't know that these jobs exist, yeah. what they're like, and what their life would be like working in these jobs. So to make, it's got to be a, a holistic approach, and that gap's got to be filled as well. Well, we also have to raise the profile. If you're talking about a, the profile of the creative industries, which is happening, and also the profile of the games industry. Now, for so long, the games have been vilified as almost the dark class of the creative industries. The, the mass market press have always concentrated on the negative parts of games. They're always saying things about the, the violent, content and the addictive nature of, of some games. Now if you put that into context, only 3% by title and 5% by value of games have got an 18 rated on them. 95% of content is family friendly, whether it's playing Angry Birds or Wii Sports in the living room or Guitar Hero. Most content these days has content available for male, female, young and old. If you've never seen a film before and I ask you to go and see Saw and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and ask you to write a critique of the film industry, it'd probably be pretty negative. But you know there's so much more to film than just those two titles. Yet the media's tended to concentrate on one or two titles in the games industry that paint a very negative perception. And that really has to change. And I think it is doing because people are carrying their smartphone devices around and playing games. 
and those who criticise games inevitably are going to become marginalised as it becomes more and more of our everyday activity. That's the child protection lobby who are often influencing that agenda uh, via the Home Office Task Force for the Protection of Minors, um, which came from Copper in the States. So that's that's another topic where, where the it's being skewed with the media coverage of games and interactive participatory uh, um, gaming um, and Facebook, etc. That agenda needs to be um, adjusted, and the good side of uh, participatory media needs to be covered um, nationally. And I'm, we agree. I'm, I'm not going to let you say more than you agree because I promise that you're out five o'clock in. You've been okay. Well, we have one more. If I'll make a dash for it. Um, uh, if there's a, if there's a, Julian, you've got a 30 second picture. Yeah. What's it going to be? Yeah, I'm trying to it's not, it's not particularly helpful or practical question. It's just, I, I was wondering whether you um, would share my view that the curriculum boundaries you place around things like maths, art, computing are part of the problem because there's a kind of tension between one of the quotes that was in your presentation and in the film was that your ideal graduate is somebody with a background in maths. Um, physics and art but in a way isn't it isn't it fair to say that we should be thinking about coding as a kind of literacy rather than something that's purely within the domain of technology which in itself is off-putting to lots of learners when it shouldn't be yes bye <laughs> <laughs>